It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Every day, more and more people are speaking out against the Premier's backroom deal with social conservatives to repeal the updated sexual health curriculum. School boards, parents, educators, and now health professionals are all speaking out against the Premier's plan to put the health and safety of students at risk. Why is the Deputy Premier ignoring the vast majority of Ontarians and going along with the Premier's plan to scrub same-sex families, gender identity, and consent out of Ontario's classrooms? Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question. What we have said from the beginning, what we said during the course of the campaign, is we want to involve parents in the consultations with respect to the sex and health and curriculum that's going to be taught in our schools. Parents were not consulted properly in the last iteration. We want to make sure that we have a thorough consultation. We want to hear from anybody who has something to say about the sex ed curriculum so that we can make sure that it is updated, that it is current, that it covers all issues, including cyberbullying, sexting, all of the other issues that we want to have covered to make sure that our students are going to be safe in our schools. We're starting that consultation process in September, and we want anybody who has something to say to be in touch with us and let us know what that is. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, this morning I welcomed uh, Dr. Andrea Chittle to Queen's Park. She's a family physician from Guelph, and Dr. Chittle joined me to announce that at least 19 health care organizations and nearly 1,800 doctors, nurses, and health care professionals have signed a petition calling on the Premier to restore the updated health curriculum in its entirety. These medical professionals say that any repeal or dismantling of the curriculum is an effort a rather an affront to the rights and to the health of Ontario's youth. Will the Deputy Premier stop listening to radical social conservatives and start listening to the Ontario doctors, nurses and healthcare professionals, professionals that are so very, very worried about our youth? I'm going to send this to her with a page. to the Leader of the Official Opposition is this. We want to hear from everyone. We welcome Dr. Chittle's comments. We welcome the comments from the other health care professionals that you're referring to, but we also want to hear from parents because parents know what's best for their children. Parents know at what age it's best for children to learn about certain things. We want to make sure that we get it right, that we make sure that all of our students are protected and that they hear the things that they need to when it's most appropriate for them. So we welcome hearing from the health care professionals, but we also want to hear from parents. Final supplementary. Speaker, almost 1,800 doctors, nurses and health care professionals are calling on the Premier to stop putting health and safety of students at risk. That should be the primary job of government, not putting our children at risk. Speaker, that's 1,800 professionals who have devoted their careers to keeping people safe and now are speaking out against this Premier because he is putting students at risk. When will the Deputy Premier find the courage, Speaker, to stand with these 1,800 medical professionals and speak out against the Premier's plan to put students in harm's way? Deputy Premier. Well, nothing is more important to all of us in this legislative chamber than the health and safety of Ontario's children. That is why we want to have a thorough consultation process to make sure that all of them are protected and that we teach them what they need to be taught so that they can be successful in today's society. But I think we also have to remember, because we've been focused on sex ed curriculum in this place for, what, a month now? There are other aspects of our children's education that are also important. For example, their math scores. We are falling behind. On that too, because that is also important Spons? for the future prosperity and well-being of our Here, children. Okay. Next 
question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next uh, question is also to the Deputy Premier, whose words ring pretty hollow. The Premier's decision to side with radical social conservatives and rip up the health curriculum puts students at risk. That is the truth, Speaker. Whether they like it or not, that is the truth. That's according to 1,800 doctors, nurses, and health care professionals, as well as scores of other parents, as well as scores of other hundreds of thousands of other uh, other. Uh, people who are very, very concerned about this speaker. Look, it is according to the RNAO, Planned Parenthood, Ontario's Midwives and Social Workers, the Alliance for Healthy, uh, Healthier Communities, Canadian Women in Medicine, the Ontario Medical Students Association, and the list goes on and on and on, Speaker. Niagara, Why is the Deputy Gordon. Premier ignoring health care leaders who are united Gordon. in saying that the Premier's plan puts the health of our children at risk? That's what the Premier's plan does. Well, thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Leader of the Official Opposition. Of course, we respect the views of health care professionals. Of course, we're going to listen to what they have to say. But they are not the only ones that have an opinion on this. Parents have an opinion. Parents know their children. Parents know Member for when Waterloo their children will come to are able to hear about certain things. Are we going to pretend that we're not going to teach them that? Of course we're going to teach them that. But we need to know when is best. And parents are the best judges of that for their own children. Their voices have not been heard. There are only 16 responses that were received for the last iteration of the physical and educational sex ed curriculum. That is not a representative sample of parents across this province. We want to hear from all parents who want to express their views. Supplementary. When is it best for kids to know about cyberbullying and sexting? When is it best for them to know about the dangers of sex and the, and the disease that they can get? Right now order. is when it's best, people. Right now. Parents, doctors, and nurses aren't the only ones that are standing up to this premier. At least 25 school boards are speaking out against this premier's plan to remove any mention of same sex families, consent, gender identity, and cyberbullying from the curriculum. Those 25 school board speakers are worried that the premier's plan will come to order. Minister of Tourism human rights will come legislation order. in our country, and they have no idea how they're supposed to teach students the outdated 1998 curriculum in just four weeks' time. Why does this deputy premier think school Question. boards should roll black back the clock to 1998 and deny students the crucial information that they need to stay safe in 2018? Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, the leader of the official opposition is presupposing what's here, going here. to be in the updated curriculum. We want to hear from parents. We want to hear from medical specialists. We want to hear from anybody who has something to say on this issue about what should be included in the curriculum. We want it to be thorough. We want to have a full consultation. We want to make sure that it's going to cover all aspects of things that young people need to learn in order to be safe in our society. But we also want to make sure that they're going to be able to be successful too. So I think we need to concentrate on a few other things as well, making sure that our students do well at school, getting up their math scores in particular so they can be competitive with the rest of the world. We need to do that. Final supplement. Speaker, the government's presupposing that kids are going to be safe without the information tools and tools that they need to be safe. Speaker. Yep. That's the problem. I apologize. The government side has to come to order. I have to be able to hear the leader of the official opposition, just as I have to hear the deputy premier. The government side has to come to order. I apologize. I'll give you extra time. The deputy premier is aiding and abetting the premier's dangerous plan, Speaker, instead of doing her job as the health minister and standing up to him. Recently, she said that when a student asks questions that aren't in the new curriculum, those conversations should not happen in a classroom. She said they should happen in private, behind closed doors. 
You'd think this, is, this deputy premier would want to install closets in every classroom to have these discussions. <laughs> Educators have said this is unbelievable <laughs> advice, and the head of the TDSB says it makes her cringe. How can this deputy premier honestly suggest that same-sex families, gender identity and consent are dirty little secrets that should be sent back into the closet? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it really is important to those Ontarians who may be watching these proceedings to correct what I actually did say yeah. in that situation. What I actually did say when I was asked whether it's all right for students to ask their teacher Opposition. questions if they have questions. I think every teacher in Ontario would say yes to that because I know I know that happens every single day. And if a student has a question and they don't have anyone else to ask, and that happens very often, is there anything wrong with them asking a teacher about that so the teacher can help them get the help they need? No, there is not. And I think it's absolutely fine for a student to ask a teacher a question. House will come to order. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question, uh, next question is also for the Deputy Premier. Transit should be a fast and affordable service for everyone in the GTA, and it should cost just $3 to take Go Transit and the Up Express anywhere in this city. But the Premier disagrees. This weekend, it was revealed that the Premier is refusing to lower the cost of Go trips within Toronto, forcing people to pay more for transit, pushing ridership even lower, and throwing Toronto's transit planning, planning into question. Why does the Premier want commuters to pay more for transit in Toronto when life is already very unaffordable? Deputy Premier. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the Leader of the Opposition for the question. We are absolutely committed to making transit more affordable here in the City of Toronto and the greater GTA. But we're also in the midst of a thorough review of the state of Ontario's finances that have been brought on by the mismanagement of the previous regime. So the, premier, the former Premier of uh, British Columbia, the Honourable Gordon Campbell, is heading up our, our uh, analysis that we will report in September, by the end of this month. And at that time, when we have a better view, a better idea, we'll be responding to this in a more complete way. But I also want to point out that and I will deal with uh, perhaps more in supplementary that this is an ongoing discussion between Metrolinx and the City of Toronto as well. I want to make it clear that at no time did Premier Ford in the campaign commit to this, to this price, but we are absolutely committed Spons. to the improvement of transit and making transit as well as life in general more affordable for the people of Ontario. Start the clock again. Supplementary. Everyone in the GTA should be able to commute anywhere in Toronto for just $3 with Go Transit and the Up Express. Fast, convenient, and affordable transit is the best way, the best way to deal with the gridlock problems that we have, to help grow our economy, and to help families spend more time together, Speaker. But the Premier himself has refused to back the $3 Go Transit. After weeks of accusing City Hall of inaction on transit and gridlock, Speaker, when will this government admit that it's actually the Premier himself who's standing in the way of fast and affordable transit for Toronto commuters? Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you again to the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Everybody would love everything to be free in this world. The reality is nothing is. But let's, let's put it into perspective. We have a debt in this province of some $320 billion. We have deficits that the previous government underestimated. The Auditor General said they've underestimated them by $6 billion. The Fa Financial Accountability Officer has said at least that much. So we have some real challenges ahead of us. What we are going to determine with our full financial analysis, looking back at all spending and all costs that uh, we've been incurred under the previous government, we have Gordon Campbell 
heading up a panel to determine just the current state of Ontario's finances. It would be irresponsible for us as a government to commit to something that we can't afford. Response. That was the style of the old government. Right. We want to make transit and life more affordable, and under Doug Ford, it will be. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Kitchener, South Hespler. The question is for the Deputy Premier. Today at Barley Days Brewery in Picton in Prince Edward County, Premier Ford formally announced that Buck of Beer is returning to Ontario. It's another promise made, promise kept. This is something that many beer consumers have been wanting for a decade, when the previous government raised the minimum floor price for beer in Ontario. Deputy Premier, can you explain to the legislature the details of just how our government is returning to buck a beer in Ontario? Great. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Kitchener South Hespler for the question. Uh, we were elected on a promise to reduce red tape and to put the people first. That includes the promise we made to bring buck a beer back to Ontario. As simply as the member said it, a promise made and a promise kept. Thanks to the previous Liberal government, the minimum price floor for beer is $1.25. But effective August 27, our government for the people will lower the minimum price floor to a dollar for any beer with an alcohol volume less than 5.6 per cent. We're going to do this opposition smartly come to order. and responsibly. Unlike the official opposition and the previous subsidize. Liberal government, we trust Ontario beer drinkers floor. and other consumers to make their own smart, mature, and responsible choices. Supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Clearly, the days of the government putting its hands in the pockets of Ontarians each time you buy a two-four or six-pack is over. It is my understanding that Premier Ford has initiated the Premier's challenge to brewers across Ontario. There has been a lot of public interest in this government commitment, and the Premier's challenge provides a great opportunity for brewers, including non-financial promotional incentives. Can the Deputy Premier please explain how this is just the first step when it comes to fulfilling our government's plan to modernize alcohol retailing in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, we're bringing back this minimum price floor to encourage competition in the beer market and to save people money. By lowering the minimum retail price for beer, the government has opened up opportunities for brewers point, in the value-priced beer category. Today, it was revealed that the LCBO is interested in discussing promotional considerations with any brewer who goes to and agrees to lower their prices on or after August 27. You know, Buck a Beer is part of the government's commitment to transforming alcohol retailing in Ontario, which includes expanding the sale of beer and wine to convenience stores, grocery stores, and big box stores. Ontario Spons. consumers first. Thank you. Question: The member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. This government's reckless decision to slash Toronto City Council has left the rest of Ontario's municipalities wondering if they will be next. Mr. Speaker, does the minister support reducing Ottawa City Council from 23 to just six councillors? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the member. Uh, bill 5, the Better Local Government Act, is a very clear bill. It, it only affects one municipality in the province of Ontario in terms of the composition of council, and it only deals with four regions when it comes to pressing the pause button on changes that were proposed by the previous government. We've been very clear Crystal in terms of the City of Toronto, the fact that Bill 5 reduces the size of that council, provides a more streamlined council. The, with all due respect, the honourable member is, uh, is fear-mongering and knows that this is only dealing with that council. That's right. Supplementary. 
Speaker, I'm just following the logic of the argument made by the minister. This government's entire justification for their undemocratic move is to align municipal wards with federal and provincial boundaries. So far, only Toronto has been targeted by this unconstitutional policy. But where does it end? Mr. Speaker, Speaker will this government begin slashing city councils province-wide, reducing council in places like Sudbury or Windsor, from 10 to 12 councillors to just two or three? Again, uh, Speaker, uh, through to the member for Toronto, Dan Forth, I've been uh, very clear Crystal in a couple clear. of weeks. Uh, we have the Association of Municipalities of Ontario Conference. Uh, one of the first decisions that I made as minister was to extend the opportunity for municipalities to ask for meetings with both myself and members of our, our cabinet. Uh, I know that that decision resulted in, in the number of meetings my ministry uh, had was, went up from 49 to uh, 77. We made it very clear uh, to uh, municipalities, and, and you know what? The, the opposition can heckle all they want, but I look forward to engaging Ontario's municipalities. I look forward to hearing their suggestions on uh, providing more efficient and more effective government, and I invite them to come to AMO as well. It's uh, an opportunity for us to hear very clearly what the municipal sector has to say. Please stop the fear mongering and let's talk about Bill 5. Next question, member for Brampton West. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services with responsibility for immigration. Minister, the crisis at the border seems to be ongoing with illegal border crossers making their way to Ontario and siphoning immigration and refugee border sources away from family reunification and international student processing. My question today on this important immigration matter is in relation to the, the federal government's response to your reasonable and straightforward request for reimbursement for our support for illegal crossers. I recall that all premiers recently agreed that the federal government should be responsible and cover costs associated with their decision to encourage and support the illegal crossing of the border as a means to access our immigration system. Question. I'm interested to know if the minister has received any response to her letter and formal request for reimbursement. Thank you very much, Speaker. I would be remiss not to say how proud we are on this side of the House to have a member from Brampton West elected here as the first international student ever to be elected in this House. A few weeks ago, I provided an itemized list of costs that have run up as a result of this irregular issue that's happening at the border in Quebec. Uh, right now, we have about $200 million and counting on itemized costs. That includes $90 million in social assistance, $74 million in shelter costs, $12 million in shelter costs for Ottawa, uh, $3 million for the Red Cross, and $20 million as a result of education. Uh, that $200 million we have asked uh, the federal government to, to pay, uh, they have come back to us uh, with no letter, uh, no offer with only $11 million, Bunch. a drop in the bucket. Oh. So I hope with the new appointment of Bill Blair as a cabinet minister for, for, responsible for the border crossings that he will come to the table and ensure that we have Thank that. you. <laughs> Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Minister, that is quite disappointing that there has been, been no response, not even an acknowledgement. I recall that you testified at a federal government hearing on the impact of crossers. I recall that your testimony to that committee focused on the financial and community impact illegal crossers is having in Ontario. Minister, the impact of illegal crossers is being felt in, in our education system, our legal aid system, our social assistance system, and in emergency shelter system. Is the federal government ignoring your testimony and letter? I know from your answer that the cost to our education system is $20 million. The cost to our social assistance system is more than $90 million, and the cost to our emergency uh, shelter system is $85 million. Did I see the new federal minister deliver a check for only $11 million to the city of Toronto against their emergency shelter cost? Hey, hey, yeah. Minister. 
Thanks very much, Speaker. This is a, an issue that has captivated the country. All 12 uh, pr premiers, uh, 13 premiers of this, pro of this country, uh, signed on with our plan to make sure that the federal government would uh, support us, including Liberal and NDP premiers. Over 67 percent of Canadians agree with the approach this government is taking in asking the federal government to pay the bills for yeah. its failed policies at the border. We are asking for $200 million. The federal government will give interviews and say we should take it from the social transfers that they send us. And I have to ask the federal Liberals, what schools do they want us to close? What hospitals do they want us to close? And what services do they not want us to deliver because they won't pay their bills? Restart the clock. Member for London West. Shit, Sattler's next. Yeah, my question is to sure. the acting premier. Speaker, this government's dangerous decision to drag Ontario backwards to 1998 has mobilized thousands of parents, students, educators, violence against women experts, and healthcare professionals yes. who are calling to keep the 2015 curriculum in place. 26 school boards representing more than 60 percent of Ontario's students have issued formal statements raising concerns about the harm this change will, ca will cause. Some school boards and thousands of teachers have said they will continue to teach the 2015 curriculum because of their professional obligation to protect the health and well-being of students. Speaker, what legal consequences will these school boards and teachers face for refusing to follow ministry direction and doing the right thing for students? Deputy Premier. Of Education. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the question, Speaker, and through you back to the member opposite. You know, we have said all along that we have every confidence in our teachers throughout this province of Ontario, and they're going to do right by our students. And when we talk about doing right by our students, it also means respecting their parents. Speaker, we made a campaign promise that we're going to keep, and we are going to respect parents and conduct a very comprehensive consultation that I think everybody in this House will be supportive of. And I invite them to join me this fall when we kick off the consultation, because we must respect parents. We must provide a forum for all people to contribute their voice. And do you know what, Speaker? The interesting part about all of this, when I say it's comprehensive, we're also going to be taking a look at getting back to the basics, and we're going to be addressing math as well. You just yes. wait. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association has warned that repealing the 2015 curriculum violates Education Act requirements for school boards to promote a positive school climate that is inclusive and accepting of all students and also violates the charter rights of LGBTQ students and right. families. Speaker, not only is this government putting the health and safety of Ontario students at risk, but it is also creating legal jeopardy for school boards and and teachers. Right. Will this government act now to end the chaos and direct school boards to continue using the 2015 curriculum when students return to school in September? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I feel it's important that we remind the opposition party that their former deputy leader and the current federal leader of the NDP party said that the lack of inclusive consultation before announcing the curriculum was disrespectful to parents. He went on to say, I urge the government to sit down with parents and allow an open dialogue before implementing changes. And so, Speaker, I am so pleased to share with you that we are going to be working with our parents. We're going to be keeping our promise to respect them, and we are going to be moving forward, and Ontario can trust us when we say we're going to be addressing what needs to be fixed in the education system. We're going to be consulting parents Spons? in terms of moving forward with our health and physical education curriculum. We're also going to be talking to our parents about what else needs to be addressed. And quite frankly, as Thank you. Thank you very much.
Stop the clock. Next question. Start the clock. Member for Ottawa, Vanier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question is Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Minister. Community and Social Services cancelled the Basic Income Pilot Project before the line-by-line -line audit. She explained her decision in the following terms. Basic Income Project is a disincentive for people to find work. When you're encouraging people to accept money without strings attached, it really doesn't send a message that our ministry and our government want to send. Is it the position of the progressive conservative government that people who are in receipt of social assistance and who are participating in the basic income pilot are lazy? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I apologize. It was referred to the Deputy Premier. Thank you. It's the Minister of Community Services. Thanks, now the Minister. Question. Um, I reject the premise of it. We haven't cancelled anything yet. We announced that we would be winding it down. We said that we would come forward with a plan in 100 days, 94 now, and that during that period of time we would have a 1.5% increase uh, to social assistance rates. But, but let me be perfectly clear. We want to help people be successful in this province, and we need to do so with equal measures of head and heart. Compassion can simply be measured by dollars and cents. We believe on this side of the House that social assistance should be about lifting people up and helping people get their lives back on track. Just giving money away is false hope. And so to begin, the basic income is a complicated research project that was failing plain and simple. A Liberal government had difficulty signing people up, and now a sizable number of those people, over 25 per cent of them, either dropped out or are failing to meet their obligations. So Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. The announcement uh, from the minister was a shock to the participants and to Ontarians, including the former senator and former chief of staff to Ontario PC Premier Bill Davis, Hugh Siegel, who said that he had assurances from the Ford campaign that the pilot would be maintained so that Ontario would see the results in terms of health, education and justice outcomes and the potential savings from various public expenditures. We're all worried about the orders that the minister has received, which I know I know that she's committed to uh, doing the right thing for the less fortunate. But why is it that we don't know what's in, in stock? I think we would expect, and I think my question is, can the Deputy Premier commit today to releasing all the mandate letters of the ministers yeah, yeah, yeah. so that Ontarians know what question. exactly there's in stock, particularly the mandate letter for the Minister of Children and Community yeah. Social Services. Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I appreciate the member's question. Look, um, given the fact that the Liberal government had difficulty signing people up to this program and that over 25 per cent are either failing to comply or they have dropped out, it calls into question whether the research is valid. Now, I have great respect for Senator Siegel, as do many people in this caucus, but I have to tell you, when we were left a set of books, um, the tough choices had to be made. So this research project was going to cost $150 million. Where I come from, that's a lot of money for research that might not be valid. And so, Speaker, when I look at the program the previous government wanted to bring him forward, it was a $17 billion program on top of a $10 billion uh, social assistance project. Speaker, I ask the member opposite, does she think Ontario's most vulnerable people should see an increase in the HST by 7 per cent? That's what this government would have done, the previous government did. They made terrible decisions that hurt the most vulnerable, but I can assure you, I will never walk away from our most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Last month, Mr. Speaker, Statistics Canada published a report that indicate violence crime in Ontario has been seen an increase of 7.1% since 2016. Mr. Speaker, this report confirmed that we already knew 
the gun and gang related violence has increased in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, with the recent Brazil and in discriminate acts of gun violence being seen in our streets, our government for the people has remained committed to public safety and keeping all Ontarians safe. Mr. Question. Speaker, could the minister please update the member of this legislature how this ministry will tackle gun violence in this province? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Markham Unionville for the question. Public safety, as we've always said, is a paramount concern to this government. Mr. Speaker, with the rise in gun and gang violence on our streets, it's clear that the current strategies no longer support our incredible police services in battling these criminal acts. Ontario's police services are among the very best in the world, and our government will remain committed to providing them, the brave men and women of these forces, with the tools and resources required to do their job safely. At my ministry, Mr. Speaker, ensuring public safety throughout the great province is our number one priority. Our government will continue to remain focused on our commitment to tackling gang and gun violence in Ontario, especially violence within the City of Toronto. Response. The status quo is failing, Mr. Speaker, and we are the only party in this House prepared to do the work that needs to be done. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister. I want to thank the Minister for his response. I'm proud to stand here today knowing that our government is committed to tackling gun and gang violence in this province and providing the men and women of Ontario Police Services with the tools and resources they so desperately need. Mr. Speaker, policing is a dangerous job, and the men and women of our, of our police services need to understand that our government for the people is here to listen to them. And we remain committed to ensure public safety across the province. To the minister, what action will you take to support our frontline officers in tackling gun violence? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, and once again, thank you for that question. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to again state that this government will continue to meet with our community safety partners over the coming weeks so that we can find solutions necessary to protect Ontarians from being the victims of senseless violence and to keep our first responders safe while performing their duties. Mr. Speaker, my ministry will be continuing our important work on examining current community safety initiatives and their effectiveness in protecting the people within this great province, as well as our many dedicated first responders. During the election campaign, Mr. Speaker, we made a promise to all Ontarians that we will commit to providing our frontline officers with the tools and resources they need to keep our community safe. Promises made, promises made. Members, take your seats. Next question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. My question is to the Minister of Natural, the Minister of Natural Resources. Northern Ontario is going through one of the worst fire seasons in recent memory. Some of those fires have been categorized by the MNR as being out of control for weeks. Evacuations and evacuation alerts have been, have been issued in many areas. Northerners are very appreciative of the resources that the province and other jurisdictions have put forward to fight these fires. My question to the Minister is, can the minister assure Northerners that all available resources will be requested and that these resources will be focused on the fires until they are brought under control? Thank you much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member very much for his question. And it's true, uh, doing, due to ongoing dry temperatures and uh, dry conditions and thunderstorms and wind, we have a uh, record amount of fires throughout Ontario this uh, season, and my ministry has been on top of this since day one, putting the necessary resources where they're needed, when they are needed. There are three types of responses to fires. There's a full response, which is an initial attack and sustained actions where the fire is out. There's a modified res response, which is a combination of suppression strategies and monitoring sections within the natural resources. And there's a monitor response to assess and determine any additional responses needed. And my ministry is on top of these, working day in and day out. And we have called out to our other jurisdictions across the province, across the country, 
across the United States and Mexico to work together to bring these fires under control. And we will continue to support Arts. our frontline fire crews fighting these fires day in and day out until they are out. Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Stop the clock. You start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you. Northerners are very appreciative of the heroic efforts of the fire rangers, water bomber crews, and everyone else who's involved in fighting this fire. And in one case, the firefighter who sacrificed his life and our condolences go out to the Godwa family. Many volunteers and community groups have also stepped up to the plate. For some, like tourist camp operators, forestry contractors, and one farmer I know who might have to evacuate his dairy herd because of the evacuation notice, their economic survival might be at stake because of this. Can the minister assure them that the province will institute emergency measures to help them survive this economic disaster? Thank you, minister. Thank you uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member for the supplemental. We have ongoing right now one of the most uh, greatest coordinated event in Northern Ontario history with sure working have. with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the local OPP, local municipalities and communities to ensure the safety of the public comes first, followed by the safety of the property to ensure that we can protect uh, businesses, we can protect cottages, we can protect public private property and public property from the damages of fire and we are succeeding in our efforts in doing so Mr. Right, Speaker. And on that note I just want to say to the people traveling up to Perry Sound, Perry Sound is open for business Mr. Speaker. That fire is 75 80 kilometers north. I think people going out this weekend to, in, to ensure to continue to go to those areas, go to ontario.ca, see where the restriction areas are placed. But when you do go to the north, start spending some extra money because those people need the economic support that we are doing to give them. We will continue to fight these fires. We will keep the public safe and we will keep property safe. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. The forest fire burning in the north end of my riding since uh, July 18th, known as Perry Sound 33, has destroyed a huge area of more than 11,000 hectares. And despite being about 75 kilometers north of the, of the town of Perry Sound, has scared a lot of people away from the whole area during this summer tourism season. I've recently heard that there have been some positive developments regarding this fire. Can the minister provide the House and the public with an update on the efforts to battle this forest fire? Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Member Perry Sound Muskoka, for that question. And I just want to take this opportunity one more time. On behalf of this legislature and on behalf of the people of this province, so I want to thank you. Thank the fire crews that are working day in and day out, and thank the support staff for taking on these fires and ensuring that we keep the public safe and keep our property safe. And Mr. Yeah. Speaker. I'm happy to report that over the weekend, Perry Sound 33 fire, that the fire perimeter has been held. Okay. Crews have been able to lay over 300,000 feet of hose to help establish this perimeter around the entire fire, ensure that it's not spreading further. In many places, crews are now working steadily in from the perimeter to fight this fire. While this progress is good news, evacuation orders and travel restrictions remain in place in the area. And these measures have been put in place to ensure public safety while allowing fire personnel to safely and effectively suppress the fire. And I do want to say, Mr. Speaker, if you're going up to Perry Sound, go up and spend lots of money. Let's support Northern Ontario. Let's support their economy. Here, here. Members, please take your seats. Supplementary. Uh, back to the minister, and thank you for that answer. I know the people of Perry Sound District will be pleased to hear the fire is no longer spreading. Most media coverage has been on the Perry Sound 33 fire. However, there are other large fires being fought in Northern Ontario. Can the minister provide an update on firefighting efforts in other parts of Northern Ontario? Minister. Thank you very much for that supplemental. And I'm happy to report a combination of improved weather over the weekend and the ongoing work by crews and teams across the province has led to an improved situation on many fires in this province. Of note, the fire in Lady Evelyn Smoothwater Provincial Park in Tomogamy, one of the largest fires in the province, is now being held. 
Provincially, resources are in good supply, and most of the actionable fires have received the support they require. We again like to commend the hard work and dedication of those who are fighting the fires, and at this time also thank our partners, thank the other provinces who have sent help, thank the uh, United States and thank Mexico for sending us their support, their firefighters, their equipment. We will continue our fight against these fires until they are out. And thank you very much for that question. Thank you. Next question, member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Last year, Toronto Police responded to over 23,000 mental health disturbance calls. There were 12,000 children waiting up to 18 months to access mental health services. Yep. And frontline hospital staff experienced record levels of violence on the job. Time and time again, our first responders, our communities, and our children bear witness to the cracks in our mental health services. Ontarians need more mental health services, not less. Speaker, why is this government cutting $335 million every year from mental health services? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for the question, but in fact, it is incorrect. We are not cutting back on our commitment to funding mental health and addiction services. In fact, we're making the biggest commitment in Ontario's history. We're adding $1.9 billion over 10 years to match the equal federal commitment. $3.8 billion is a lot of money. We are adding to previous commitments. There is no cut whatsoever because you're quite right. There is a lack of connection for services. We need to make sure our first responders are ready to be able to help people with a mental health or addictions problem for their own safety and for the safety of the person who is not well. We know we need to work with 12 different ministries to connect that patchwork of services to make sure that people have housing, that they have the health services, both mental and physical health services they need to make sure they can get the education Spons. they need to be able to get out of poverty. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. I'd like to answer more on the supplemental, but I think it's important to know we are adding to services. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. You know, and thank you for mentioning housing. For years, Speaker, mental health professionals have been calling on the government to increase the number of supportive housing units yep. to enable those facing mental health challenges to get the help that they need. In my community of Scarborough, people are waiting for more than 10 years to get supportive housing space. During the campaign, the Conservative Party campaigned on a promise to improve mental health services, not gut them. Will this government tell the House why are they reneging on their promise? Minister. We made a promise to the people of Ontario that we were going to build a comprehensive mental health and addiction system. We have $3.8 billion to put into that over 10 years, and that is what we are going to do. We have to work on a variety of systems. We want to work with existing mental health service providers out there, CMHA, uh, KMH. We want to work with um, children's mental health. We want to make sure that everyone from small children to seniors are connected. But you're absolutely right with respect to housing. There is a lot more that needs to be done. They say everyone needs a job, a home, and a friend. Well, the home part is missing. In many places, the job's missing, and the friends are missing too. So we need to fix that. That's what we're going to do, working across a variety of ministries. It's it's not going to be siloed anymore into this is the part that I deal with, this is the part that you deal with, because you don't get a comprehensive Response. system that way. It's too fragmented. We are going to connect services and systems so that people will get the right help that they need when they need it. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Toronto Sun called the Liberals' carbon tax scheme plan a Peter Pan approach to carbon pricing. The National Post proclaimed the Liberals were in retreat over their I asked, asked the member who is the question to? Which minister? Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of the Environment. And after years of government here at Queen's Park that rolled over any time the federal government asked for anything, we finally have a government who is standing up for the people. Sorry, not sorry. 
Will the Minister of the Environment commit to this place that he will continue to fight a Trudeau carbon tax of any kind and of any size? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Carleton, thank you for that question. Last week, I was very pleased to join my colleague, the Attorney General, as we announced our next steps as a government to fight the Trudeau carbon tax. Our government promised that we would take steps to protect Ontario families, to help job creators, at the same time as pursuing a real action plan that would support the future of our environment. Here, here. That plan will not include a regressive carbon tax. All right. We understand that carbon taxes are not effective, and the people of Ontario understand that a carbon tax will not be revenue neutral. We know it, Ontario businesses know it, the people of Ontario know it, and now the Prime Minister is indicating that perhaps he knows it. With all of the uncertainty in the economy today, with all of the tension in our trade relationships, Ontario does not need a job-killing carbon tax. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. I thank the minister for his response. And Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the minister. It's no surprise the federal government plan to impose a carbon tax on the people of Ontario is falling by the wayside. As the minister mentioned, last week our government announced our intentions to vigorously challenge the authority of the federal government to impose a national carbon plan. And Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to know that we are on the side of the people. Just over a week ago, a new poll was released that reported two-thirds of Canadians, 64 per cent, agree with our policy and believe that emissions should have uh, provinces should have jurisdiction over how to reduce emissions. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of the Environment confirm that he will continue to fight for what's best and for what's right for the people? Minister. Mr. Speaker, through to the member from Carleton. As the member noted, the federal government has started its climb down after seeing the writing on the wall, not just from the polls, which are, are very interesting, but after direct feedback from Canadian business, Canadian business that went to them and said, we can't be competitive globally when we have the pressure of this carbon tax. Yep. The Trudeau government has finally admitted the carbon tax is a bad idea. Mr. Speaker, a tax is a tax, and the federal government is acknowledging that the carbon tax is bad for jobs and bad for investment. If the Prime Minister is willing to cut carbon tax deals with big business, he should not stop at half measures, and he should be willing to eliminate his carbon tax on the people of Ontario. Here, here. Our message to the Prime Minister was clear. Prime Minister, it's never too late to do the right thing. Yeah. Scrap your carbon tax. Stand up for the families of Ontario. Stand up for jobs in Ontario. Right. Please take your seats. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Three weeks ago, I asked the Minister if the anticipated 3% increase to social assistance rates would be going forward. I asked the Minister this because constituents of mine I've spoken to in Ottawa have worried that this increase would not be honoured under her government. The Minister responded by saying, quote, I want to ensure that the people, particularly the most vulnerable in our province and in our city, are looked after. Can the minister, can the minister explain? Can the minister explain, Speaker, how cutting the incomes of poor people is going to help them? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I'd like to uh, thank the member for his question. Um, we actually are increasing rates by 1.5 per cent across the board for those who are on Ontario Works and who those who are on ODSP. We had to do this because we have to hit the hot pause button. The previous Liberal administration left our government a disjointed patchwork system that wasn't helping people. So what we have decided to do is hit the pause button on that. Make sure that 1.5 cross the board increase goes through on September the 1st and ensure that in 94 days from today that we have a plan that will lift people up, get them back to work where they can, and assist those people who need it most. And I look forward to working with the honourable member opposite, listening to him and listening to those who are in poverty right now. Did you know, as a result of failed Liberal policies that that party supported 97 per cent of the time, one in seven Ontarians are in poverty? That's unacceptable. Acceptable. We're going to change that. Members 
Council, please take your seat. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, much as I appreciate the aerobics on the other side, this is a cut, plain and simple. <laughs> One and a half percent is well below the rate of inflation, and there are thousands of families in our city and in this province who will suffer as a result of that action. And at the meantime, my friends on the opposite side are happy to ask the poor and the disabled to do more with less, but you're cutting taxes on the most profitable corporations in this province by a billion dollars in lost revenue. So I have a question. Why is this government punishing people who are poor and disabled, but handing out buckets in corporate welfare to your wealthy friends. Minister. I welcome, I welcome the member's question, and I look forward to, uh, to speaking with him. But let me assure you that people in need will be heard not only by me, but this government. What we have said is we are going to fix a disjointed patchwork system that is keeping our most vulnerable down when we should be lifting them up and restoring dignity for those people who need it most. If someone finds himself requiring assistance from a program of last resort, we have a responsibility to support that person and get them stabilized and back on track. But let me tell you something. The current system is broken. One in five people stay on Ontario Works for more than five years. One in seven people in Ontario are living in poverty. More than 200,000 people were added to social assistance over the past 15 years. And right now, 46,000 people have been Ontario Works for Spons. more than five years. And the people who are relying on ODSP has increased by 3% annually. That's 10,000 people every year. We can do better. I can do better. We will together. Stop the clock. Next question, start the clock. Member for Haldeman, Norfolk. To the Attorney General, last Thursday our government announced, in keeping with our commitment to people in Ontario, we're launching our own challenge of the federal carbon tax in the Ontario Court of Appeal, a challenge we can win. This announcement was made a few short weeks after the Premier announced Ontario will also be participating in Saskatchewan's challenge in the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal. While we know the Trudeau Liberals' carbon tax will obviously drive up the cost of goods and services we all rely on every day, some have been asking why the rationale, what is the rationale for participating in two challenges? Can the Attorney General share with this House why participating in two challenges is important? Good question. The Attorney General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am happy to clarify the necessity of this approach. Ontario is working cooperatively with Saskatchewan to ensure that both provinces' references proceed as efficiently and as affordably as possible. Combined with our partners in Saskatchewan, our ask of our respective courts of appeal will allow for broad consideration of all possible arguments regarding the validity of the federal carbon tax. Anywhere the federal carbon tax is being constitutionally challenged, we want to be part of that fight, Mr. Speaker. We believe this, this approach can only increase our likelihood of success. We were elected with a mandate to stand up for Ontario taxpayers, and that's exactly what we're doing. Members, please take your seats. Well, uh, through you, Speaker, I would like to uh, thank the Attorney General for that explanation. And uh, we all realize it's important we stand up for people in Ontario, and I know this government is working hard to do just that. I also know it will be a great day when we win this challenge for the people of Ontario. <clears throat> To that end, uh, Speaker, I'm wondering uh, if the Attorney General can speak a bit more about the benefits uh, of our government's efforts and what we can see to benefit people in Ontario. The Attorney General. 
Through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from uh, Haldeman Norfolk for the follow-up question, and I agree wholeheartedly with his comments. Challenging the Trudeau Liberals' carbon tax is important. Our government campaigned on a promise to the people that we would work hard to put money back in taxpayers' pockets and bring real relief back to families. By challenging the federal carbon tax, we are working hard to deliver on these commitments. As I said in this House last week, our ask of the Ontario Court of Appeal is to provide advice on whether or not the federal carbon tax is unconstitutional in whole or in part. Our legal team is going to work hard and has been working hard to build our case, and our government is confident in our position and that we will win. I am also confident that this challenge, which will be using in-house lawyers at the Ministry of the Attorney Once. General, will cost significantly less than initially thought. Our government knows that this challenge will protect the hardworking people of Ontario from an unaffordable. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. The member for Kiwetanong. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, my question is to the Minister of uh, Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, First Nations communities uh, in my writing have been denied access to adequate uh, health care for far too long. This has to change. Uh, there is a severe uh, shortage of uh, medical resources, safe health uh, care infrastructure, medical professionals in northern communities. And it's costing uh, too many lives, causing too many uh, people to suffer. Uh, there was a document that was signed between Canada, Ontario, and Anishinaabasuke Nation called the Charter of Relationship Principles Governing Health System Transformation in Non-Territory. Will this government commit to fully uh, funding the First Nations health transformation, or will this government renege on, uh, on that commitment and force people in our communities to continue to suffer? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for health and long-term care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for the question. It is a very serious issue. We've had a brief conversation about it before. I recognize that there are um, serious problems with uh, health care in uh, northern Ontario, some of the fly-in communities as well. This is a priority for me. I look forward to working with you to make sure that we can improve health care outcomes for people across the province. It is unequal distribution. There are inequities there, and uh, I do take it seriously. I would uh, like to hear more from you and work with you on that. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, the needs of the people of the Rio North uh, cannot be ignored any longer. In Sandy Lake, uh, the, Sandy, uh, the nursing station model is not working anymore for the, that services uh, 3,000 plus. Local residents are filling the gaps because of the, there aren't enough medical professionals. In Sandy Lake, uh, Pekanjigam and other remote flying communities Little children uh, like Brody, five-year-old uh, Brody Makers have died of strep throat uh, infections. Uh, that would have been cured anywhere else. And every single day I hear families and, uh, who cannot get the urgent health care they need. Uh, the charter I spoke about calls for accountability, responsibility, and resource allocation directly to the communities. Will the minister guarantee that every dollar that's been committed to First Nations health care uh, will be delivered to our communities? Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I was aware of the child who, who died uh, from strep throat because basic antibiotics weren't at the nursing station. I have had the opportunity to visit Sandy Lake, and I know there are many other communities that are in a similar situation. As we have discussed, part of the problem is the fact that there is federal responsibility for some of the, the fly-in communities to provide health services, but the provincial government operates uh, the ambulance and, of course, the um, hospital services. They will need to be better coordinated. I certainly will be speaking with the federal minister about that, but I know there are many other issues that need to be uh, solved so that we don't lose children, we don't lose people in communities. That would not happen in other parts of Ontario. I agree with you. Much work needs to be done, and I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.